Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, December 2nd, 2021. Once again, it's my great pleasure to be back with Professor Barry Simon. Barry, good to be with you again. Likewise. Barry, I'd like to pick up on one point from our previous discussion where I might have asked the question in a way that assumed something that might not have been the case. So in asking you about how you felt when you first wore a kippah publicly, I might have assumed that there was no one else around in your world who was doing that. Was that in fact true? Or were there other outwardly observant Jews in your milieu? So it's not only in my milieu, I mean, I didn't know, right? So, right, you have to remember one of my professors that I mentioned earlier at Harvard was Shlomo Sternberg. Um, he always wore a beret, not a uh, um, kippah. I think I've seen him once without the beret. Um, on the other hand, uh, there were two other senior mathematicians at the time, um, Hillel Furstenberg, who got the Abel Prize last year, and uh, Leon Aaron Price, who were religious, and who, as far as I know, I mean, I've never seen them except in a key pod now. I didn't meet them until probably five years after the time we're talking about, but I have no doubt. In any event, it was not unusual and even at Princeton, um, my uh, wife and I moved into Hib and McGee, which were junior faculty housing. And there were five couples that were religious that sort of every Friday night got together to sort of schmooze with each other. Uh, one of the others was an assistant professor in mathematics at Princeton. One of them was an instructor at Princeton. One of them was a postdoc in physics. So it was not unusual. And, it, you know, it, it, it's one of the reasons probably didn't even occur to me that it was an issue. But, but uh, it's not unusual. In fact, what's sort of interesting is there are lots of observant mathematicians it's not that there are none in physics, but it's rarer than in mathematics. But in mathematics, you see them a lot. There was a point where I think Harvard has something like 20 faculty, 20 senior faculty. There was a point when three were observant Jews um, since two have gone to Israel and one's retired. But there was a point when there were three out of 20 so it's not an unusual phenomenon. Barry, as you were making this transition and all of the the Shilas that might come up, did you have a Rav in your life at this point? Who was your no, spiritual no, advisor? No, we were not really. We were we we did have some Shilas. We went. We had one Shila that that we went and asked uh, a rabbi. We my wife knew who was connected with academics, but he was in New York and it was a very special issue. Um, no, not, not at that point. Um, once we moved, so after my daughter was born, we felt we needed to be closer to an observing community. We moved to um, uh, New Jersey. To, well, we were in New Jersey. We moved to uh, Edison Highland Park, and the, there was a rabbi there in the local shul. Um, I remember one shaila I had is I was going to Japan, and the question was when one kept Shabbos because of the dateline. Um, Classic question. And at the time, and at the time, I had an observant graduate student who was actually also taking rabbinic classes at uh, uh, at uh, Yeshiva University and with, in fact, Rav Soloveitchik, the junior Rav Soloveitchik, not the, who's also quite, who was for many years a uh, Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshiva University. And he told him it's a very complicated question where the dateline is. He should ask his local rabbi. I asked my local rabbi, and he looked at me as if I was crazy and said, on Saturday, what's the question? 
great. And, you know, once we moved to, to Los Angeles, we had many more Shilas and, and uh, we have a very good uh, local Rav here who's very learned, but who often on the questions we asked, he would go, he would bring it up the tree. He right. would have someone in New York he would consult. Um, that's who I consulted for most questions. And then well, there's a fellow named Rabbi Adlerstein where he got his mighty Rebbe. Although he normally said, well, you have your communal rub, you should ask him your shyness, but occasionally I would ask him my adversary. But certainly when this process began, you know, we were in Princeton, which is a, a midbar as far as um, <laughs> out in the in, wilderness. In serious <laughs> in those days, certainly. They're, 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 it's a little more serious now, but I'm not sure if it's even now or I don't know what the situation is at Princeton. Mary, I know you've said you're not overly philosophical, but as you were becoming from, thinking about your family's history back in Europe, do you feel like you reactivated some latent observance that goes back in generations? So it's certainly true that I did. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure that at the time I was thought about it so much. But as I got older, I became more reflective about such things. And it's certainly clear that uh, my father's parents were observant, and I'm sure going back many, many generations. On my mother's side, it's not clear. I know her, as I mentioned, her parents, her father was, was anti-religious. I'm not quite sure about her grandfather. Um, but I'm sure, you know, I have a son, as I mentioned, who's a Talmud Chacham. I'm sure my maternal grandfather would be turning over on his grave at that thought. On the other <laughs> hand, uh, my father's father, I'm sure, would chef nachts. Barry, let's return to the, to the research. So there's two other items I want to bring up that I know happened before you had achieved tenure. So let's start first with complex scaling. Tell me a little bit about your work in complex scaling and particularly why it was of such interest in quantum chemistry and quantum field theory. Well, actually not quantum field theory. I'm not really aware it's been used much there um, in atomic physics as well as quantum chemistry. So <laughs> I partly think of it, I'm not sure anybody else does, as, as a mystery. For me, a missed opportunity, not that I didn't get involved later, but um, I mentioned last time that, that Ani Dickey and Arthur Whiteman had come to me on this question about um, anharmonic oscillators. That's what got me into that subject. And the whole issue involved um, under s s real scaling, things are implemented by unitaries, is there some way of analytically continuing in a complex parameter? And I came up with a very simple argument that essentially said, yeah, I, they, in fact, the eigenvalues are not only invariant under real parameters, but also under complex parameters. And I never asked myself, even though you have the same kind of underlying analyticity, um, what happens in say the case of the Coulomb an atomic system with decaying potentials where you don't have discrete spectrum. Um, and if I had asked that, I would have discovered what's called complex scaling. And I probably should have asked it, but again, you have missed opportunities. And about a year later, a French uh, mathematical physicist named Jean-Michel Combe who was based in Marseille for his entire career, um, essentially didn't ask this question, but he wrote a paper on a technical issue, but in an appendix, he developed what we would now call complex scaling. And he had the good idea I may have been involved and told him that the appendix was much more interesting than the paper. 
but he did an appendectomy and turned the appendix into a full-fledged paper, which you, original paper with the students. Then there was a more important paper that did it for end body scattering, but they realized that it's really much more fascinating that continuous spectrum actually shifts away from the real axis <coughs> to expose potential bound states and resonances. And I realized immediately that this gave one a tool that one could use to understand what's called time-dependent scattering, uh, perturbation theory. So when I talked about Bailey Schrodinger perturbation theory, that in, in quantum mechanics classes is called time-independent. Um, it has to do with what happens to eigenvalues that remain discrete. Uh, and in the, when you have an embedded eigenvalue, it has a finite lifetime and it was normally studied by what looked like a different ad hoc method. And the miracle is that when you have complex scaling, this Im what I found is this embedded eigenvalue becomes an isolated eigenvalue. You, you can apply the same methods that Kotto and Relic had derived and suddenly you got it wasn't a new perturbation theory, the same ideas that would let you understand um, uh, the, the um, time, so-called time-independent case would also work in the time-dependent case, and you could actually get a convergent series, and you got lots of beautiful results. And the quantum chemists became very interested in this technique because they could use it for numerically computing resonance widths, which was a very interesting problem. Um, and then further, one of the postdocs working in our group understood what happens in electric field. I did work with him. So this was a something I began um, probably about a year before I got tenure, and I'm sure it was a factor in my tenure case, but I continued to work on it for 10 or 12 years. Quantum chemists were very interested. In fact, the name complex scaling was invented by the quantum chemists. It had, uh, Colm actually called the dilatation analyticity, and I shortened that to dilation analyticity, which is much more awkward name. Complex scaling became the standard name and it caught on and was actually quite uh, quite interesting and and clearly made enough of a splash that at one point um, I was getting NSF funding half from math and half from physics and my physics program officer said the quantum chemistry officer had approached him and they wanted part of my grant. <laughs> Were you flattered? I was flattered, although the interesting thing is it resulted that on one of the renewals, I had the, the most negative review I've ever gotten because it went to some quantum chemist who regarded all of mathematical physics as junk. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, but, but yeah, I was flattered. I, I thought it was... It was I was not shocked because the you know there it was a quantum quantum chemist who ran regular schools and had a whole school on it in Florida. It was actually quite quite a big deal among the quantum chemists. And Barry it remains the, so to some extent. On the quantum field theory work, where where does the name hypercontractivity come in? So Ed Nelson um, actually, before just before I was a graduate student, did some very important work involving, he realized that to get various results, you, you really needed um, 
you could use, not need it, but you could use some improvements. Um, you not long before him, mathematicians had studied what are called contraction semigroups. That's a, a semigroup that uh, or a group that for which norms decrease semi-group for which norms in general decrease their contractions. And often you have a situation where they act on all the LP spaces and it increase it um, uh, it <coughs> it's a contraction on all the LPs. And what Ed realized is that in particular case of the harmonic oscillator in a certain representation for it, you actually were remained for, after at least for, for, a, for a large enough time, you actually were bounded from L2 to L4. And this was very useful. So you were better than being just contracted. And Irving Siegel then did some important work, and and uh, when I was a uh, let's see, I was probably this my was my first year as an instructor. There was another, there was a visitor named Raphael Hochron, and he and I sort of got interested in understanding what Siegel had done and rephrased everything, and we decided there needed to be a name for this property that Ed had described discovered. And we called it, we decided to call it hypercontractivity. Um, and the funny thing is, at some point, Ed complained to me that I shouldn't be been called hypercontractivity, should have been called hyperbounded, because it wasn't a contraction from L2 to L4, it was only a bound. And I said, you're right, except hypercontractivity sounds much better. Um, <laughs> and in fact, this became a bit, this has been widely used since I think the last time I looked, there were several thousand search on, on Google search on hypercontractivity, you'll get thousands of hits. Um, and then I had a graduate student named Jay Rosen who proved that for a slightly different class of objects that enter in um, uh, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you actually had something that was more contractive. Instead of being bounded, if you waited for a large enough time, um, they were bounded instantly. For any positive time, you were actually bounded from L2 to L4. And I suggest that he called this super contractivity, uh, which didn't, doesn't have much literature. But uh, then about 10 years after this original work with Hochrone, uh, in fact, the same time I was in Australia doing my Berry's phase work, uh, a British mathematician I know named Brian Davies was there. Sorry, I forgot to, to turn off the phone again. I meant to, but, um, and he discovered that in some context that was particularly interesting, you got, um, uh, you became instantly, went instantly from LP to L infinity, which was even better. And I remember he and Eric Robinson, who was our host, and I had a meeting we were trying to figure out what to call it, what was better than super contractivity. And uh, Derek suggested jokingly, oh, you can call it super duper contractivity. <laughs> and we eventually came up with the name ultra contractivity. <laughs> and if, again, it became very popular. You'll find again, thousands of hits for ultra contractivity. So, you know, besides, uh, in fact, I'm sort of proud. There are many names I've invented that have stuck. Um, hypercontractivity is one. Uh, uh, um, 
I'm suddenly having a senior moment. But uh, uh, Paco's inequality, CLR inequality, HBZ theorem, there are just many standard names, diamagnetic inequalities, that, uh, and, and various phases that, that you know, and, and I guess I have a good sense of naming. <laughs> And then finally, Barry, to, to round out the quantum field theory work, you know, in 1972, prior to 1972, what was your work connecting lattice approximations to the statistical mechanical models? Okay, so it wasn't that we, we it's better to say that, so let me step back because I should give some background on, on, on so Ed, Ed Nelson was a, really innovative uh, person in quantum field theory. He not only um, uh, did this work that led to hypercontractivity, to the term hypercontractivity, the first person to understand this new thing. He also understood there was some earlier work trying to look at what's called Euclidean field theory, which means you, so normal field theory is done in, um, of course, Minkowski space, space time uh, with the, with the Lorentz metric where, where uh, the natural, uh, objects are hyperbolous because time and space have a different setting. And one of the things that Whiteman had realized, and I think others before Whiteman, was that it was very, that quantum, that correlation functions in quantum field theory could be analytically continued in the space and time parameters. And if you, um, analytically continued from real time to imaginary time, then the Minkowski metric became a Euclidean metric. So space and time had the same setting. And Schwinger had first suggested that you might even be able to formulate fields in a Euclidean framework and semantic went further, but Nelson actually realized there was a full, um, uh, framework for this that really could be viewed as an extension of uh, the Feynman Cotts formula to a quantum field theoretic setting. And it was sort of interesting because this really was revolutionary work, which Ed began talking about, let me get the years right. So probably early in 1971. And it didn't make much of a splash at all. And one of the reasons was the it he Ed is very much thinks like a probabilist, and so it it really it was a language that was so strange to the people who were doing the functional analytic approach that it wasn't really appreciated, and it was Ed didn't really have any striking uh, new applications of these ideas of the ideas to technical issues. And things changed remarkably in January of 1972. Let me just make absolutely sure I have the years right. Yes, in January of 72. When Francesco Guerra, he may have done a little earlier, announced or talked about a 
uh, some applications he'd done. So Guerra was a very quiet guy, was a visitor from Naples, probably had Italian money, was visiting Princeton, had heard um, Nelson's lectures, and I literally had probably talked to him very briefly twice um, in the year and a half that he was in Princeton before this January of 72. And in December, when Arthur Whiteman and I were at a conference, he said, you know, just before I left, Guerra told me he had some interesting results. He really wanted to tell you of an in constructive field theory. He really wanted to tell you about them. And we decided that, that Arthur and I and Lon Rosen, who's somewhere else I've been working on, uh, should meet together with Guerra and he could explain to us what he'd done. And he began by writing down on the blackboard three statements that he was going to prove. And afterwards, Lon and I compared notes, and we both had the same reaction. This was so much beyond what anyone could do that we both thought to ourselves, yeah, sure, you're going to do that. <laughs> and literally 15 minutes later, he'd done it by starting out with a result that Nelson had mentioned in his talks. And he just had a few steps. And eventually, we actually found a version that takes about three minutes that uses some convex function theory. It, it just, it suddenly became clear that this Euclidean field theory ideas were incredibly powerful, not only conceptually, but on a um, uh, on an intellectual, on a technical level. You could prove lots of interesting things with it. And Guerra agreed that it made sense that the three of us, that is Lon Rosen and Guerra and I, should work together um, in exploiting these ideas further. We, within a short period, had improved these three results that he'd written down. And we had found uh, about a week later a very quick, simple proof using these Euclidean ideas of a result that Glim and Jaffe had announced that seemed to have a very complicated proof. And I still remember that about a month later, Glim came to Princeton and gave a talk on this work of Glim and Jaffe. And afterwards, Lon and I took him aside and showed him this simple proof. And he was just as we were in shock after Guerra had shown us what he was in total shock because, right, this, this thing that had a very comp suddenly had, and I would say that after that, within a few weeks, everyone had stopped thinking about quantum field theory in any way except using these Euclidean ideas. So there was this huge revolution that uh, the heroes to me are, are uh, Nelson and Guerra, although Lon and I had something to do with it. And we then extended it further. And we realized it was quite natural in understanding uh, what, what was going on to shift to a lattice approximation, that is to take this Euclidean space and replace it by a lattice version. So we essentially invented what is called lattice field theory, at least for these Boza models, which is all that Nelson had considered at the time. About a year and a half later, um, uh, Ken Wilson, without knowing about work, I'm not sure he ever learned about our work. I think 20 years later, he didn't realize we had done what we did. He reinvented or rediscovered it, but in a much more general context that also included lattice gauge theories. So he's the, but 
we essentially, before Wilson, even though it's become a standard tool in high energy physics, we developed this lattice approximation. And we realized that really what it, what it, uh, what quantum field theory in this lattice approximation became was um, a model that looked a lot like the classical easing model, where at each site you have a plus or minus spin, except the spin, instead of taking plus or minus values, took arbitrary real values and uh, uh, the techniques, the technical results involving, say, correlation inequalities that had been developed in understanding easing type models could then be applied to um, quantum field theory. So we wrote this paper where Rosen and I wrote this long paper. In fact, it was so long, the annals, which, which is the most prestigious journal, at least at the time in, in mathematics, there are now some competitors. Um, the annals refused to uh, insist, rather they, they took it, but they insisted we break it in two because it would have taken a whole issue otherwise. And they said, we can't have an article that takes the whole issue. You have to break it in two. So, that, so it appeared in two parts. Um, and then the next year, Griff Griffiths and I found a further thing that allowed you to prove a Liang theorem for quantum field theory. So this was, this was very important work. While much of it was done before I was officially promoted to tenure, it, it, most of it was done just at the period that my tenure was being approved. So I don't think this had a big factor in, in the tenure decision, but it made a big impact. Um, in, and continues to be uh, important in uh, quantum field theory and statistical mechanics and the fact that they're regarded as sort of two, two, two sides of, of the subject. Barry, a general Princeton question around this time. With people like John Wheeler and Bob Dickey and Jim Peebles, I've heard it said that black holes were more real at Princeton than they were elsewhere. So for you and with your mathematical sensibilities, were black holes more on your radar than they might otherwise have been? No. So, I mean, I sort of knew about their work, but it, it's, it's in general, general relativity was a very separate, was regarded somehow as a very different, it's, it's always been true that it's a, it's a very different discipline. And it's hard for me to think of any mathematical physicist who has, done sort of significant rigorous mathematical work both in general relativity and uh, other parts of, of uh, right well it's true that someone like me has worked in non quantum mechanics and physical mechanics and quantum field theory um, not general relativity and I again it's it's just because the the ideas there there are cl incredibly close mathematical links between quantum field theory and statistical mechanics, as I just discussed, and certainly quantum field theory and non-relativistic quantum mechanics. In some sense, quantum field theory is just non-relativistic quantum mechanics in an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but. General relativity is a very different subject, and it's one of the reasons why we still don't have a theory of quantum gravity, because it's really a very different framework. Now, that doesn't mean someone can't work in both. There are someone like Steve Weinberg, who's in the non-mathematical side, who've done work in both areas. You could in principle, but there, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone who has, and I certainly have never done anything serious. Which is kind of counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive because long before black holes were observed, they existed only as mathematical concepts. 
That's correct. But again, the, the people who were doing that kind of mathematics, well, uh, uh, Hawking, who was, did, mo- did, mo- did both mathematically rigorous things and not, and Penrose, and you know, there are other people like Bob Garosh. They're different people. And it, the, the mathematics is, the mathematics that they do is very different from the, that they use is very different from the mathematics that uh, my side of the field does. Um, in some sense, they are basically using ideas from differential geometry into first approximation. Uh, my uh, people doing field theory and statistical mechanics and non realistic quantum mechanics are using methods from functional analysis. And it's not, they're just mathematically very different. Now, when it came up for your tenure decision, by the time that became a, a real, you know, it was, it, it was on the horizon, was there any drama? Was it a foregone conclusion that you would be awarded tenure at Princeton? Well, it's not a question that I would be awarded tenure in the sense that it wasn't natural for me to come up with tenure. So I didn't realize this at the time, but I'm sure what precipitated it is that Berkeley decided that I was worthy of tenure and they were going to steal me. This is probably due to Kato's influence, I'm guessing. Um, And so I think what precipitated it, I was totally unaware of this, is that some of the people at Princeton, probably Nelson and Whiteman, got requests for letters of recommendation. And it was, they knew that if, well, they assumed that I'm probably correct, although there is the famous example 15 years before me of Don Spencer, who had tenure at Harvard and returned to Princeton as an untenured assistant professor because he liked Princeton so much and was then eventually promoted to tenure. But it was pres- they presumed probably correctly that if I'd gotten a tenure offer from Berkeley and they hadn't matched it, I would leave. So they realized it was time to fish and cut bait and they realized they should, they'd better cut bait. So I think that's prop again, I was not aware that this is the reason. I was just told, you know, we decided we're gonna promote you to tenure. Now to foreshadow to to Caltech, was the possibility of moving to California, Northern California, was that particularly attractive to your wife at the time? No, she's really a Los Angeles person, yeah. not uh, not general, it's not California. Her parents grew up in Los Angeles. And as you may know, we're in the same state, but we're in different worlds. Right, of course. <laughs> so no, no. And and again, one of the other issues that, that is a big factor in terms of, uh, it is true that people with academic careers will often um, go to, we, who are observant will go to places where there's no place where their kids or very little choice for their kids to go to school and, you know, not many shuls and they make that choice. And I might have made that choice if I had no other choice, but if you have options between a place, right. It, there wasn't much for us in that view in Princeton, but there was not far away in um, the New Brunswick Highland Park area, it, it might not have been so attractive. My wife might not have been very thrilled about the idea of moving to Northern California because it doesn't have the same possibilities then, not at all, even now, not much. Um, so that was always a restriction in the sense that we would prefer a place that had that was more Jewishly, had more Jewish services available, if you will, had more of a Jewish community. And given that I have that as an option, I would pick that. So it wasn't a very hard choice between Berkeley and, and uh, Princeton. And the timing, was tenure finalized 
before you took the leave to go to France and Switzerland? So I don't know what finalized means. The so, offer letter. You had it in no, hand. No, the offer letter. Well, there's no offer letter because this was an internal promotion. So you don't get a letter. At some point, you do get a letter saying you've been promoted. But the way things work is the department's vote. And after that, at Princeton, it's presumably never happened in history that the math and physics department has made a, a promotion to tenure that has not gone through eventually. And the, the process is that it then takes time because it needs to get approved by the central administration. And then eventually it has to get approved by the trustees. That's in every place in, the, in at least I would say in the world, except there's this famous recent case in, in uh, um, University of North Carolina, I think it was, yeah, where, yeah, yep. right? But normally the trustees, it's a, right? So the, you know, presumably the formal promotion only happened, the trustees have these meetings once a year, probably only happened in June. But I was already told you're going to be promoted, you know, we voted to promote you to tenure probably in December would be my guess of 1971. Probably the, I was told the central administration had approved it in February. Certainly my, the, the, there had been some discussion of my going on leave the year before, but uh, the, the, before December, the form it was probably formalized at the same time that this was happening. But, but I, I'm sure it was all you know the, the actual formalities of going on leave was long before I got the actual letter. So if I could reframe the question, when you're going to Europe, it's with the assurance that tenure is in hand. Well, at the time we actually left for Europe, which was. Um, so I think that was, yes, that was the year we went off to Brazil for the summer. Even by then, I probably had, again, I didn't worry about the fact that the trustees hadn't officially approved it. Certainly before we left to, for Bra to Brazil for the summer, um, I knew I had been promoted to tenure. There wasn't a question. Whether I had the formal letter, I have no idea. And what, what specifically, where did you go in Europe? What institutions did you visit? So we spent, there were sort of, at the time, there were sort of three big centers in mathematical physics in Europe. And we spent a third of the year essentially in each of them. So we spent roughly three months each in uh, Paris, near Paris at the IHES that I mentioned in this suburb of Paris called Bourgeois Bet, and then three months in Marseille uh, at the CNRS, and then three months in uh, Zurich at the ETH, Edgnische Technical Hochschule, quite in my bastardized. Spitzerdeutsch. You took the whole family with you? Um, this was 72, 73. My oldest daughter was only born in 74. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we had, we had no kids at the time. However, we tended to go away in the summer in, for much of my career, most summers. And, you know, we would take, when we had five kids, we would often travel with five kids. Um, Primary question, how was Kashrus in, in Europe? So both the, all three places I mentioned were um, had thriving Jewish communities. There wasn't anything to speak of at um, at IHES that was that's outside Paris. Um, they had very nice housing. We, at the time, did not 
we did not have a place to go for Shabbos. Um, for the, we were there actually for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we stayed at a hotel in Paris. Uh, there are there were restaurants open in the area up near the Opera, um, and there are hotels, and we stayed at a hotel there. And uh, um, there was a shul we went to for davening on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. There was no place for Shabbos. Um, in Marseille, we lived in a little fishing village outside of Marseille. Again, there was no place for Shabbos. There was there were kosher butchers, so my wife would go into, and I probably went with her. We would go into this area near the opera. There were there are essentially two religious areas in Paris, and we happened to go to one of them. Um, we go to the butcher to get meat, and you know, we tashed what we needed to, and. and uh, and similarly in Marseille, there was a butcher, there were kosher butchers in, um, they were actually near the Institute in Marseille, but nobody uh, in the Institute lived in Marseille. In fact, I think that part of Marseille, while it had a Jew, the Jewish community was not regarded as very high class and, and perhaps not even very safe. There were these two villages, uh, further along the coast where everyone, all the senior faculty stayed. And we stayed in one of them was a little fishing village called Cassis. That was really very nice. Um, when we were in Zurich, we lived in the housing of the ETH, um, which had just, so the ETH split into two parts and the physics section, which I was visiting, I was visiting the mathematical physics there has always been centered primarily in physics because that's where Res Yost was. Um, so we had housing there. It was probably an hour walk into the area where the shuls were. Um, the first Shabbos, we were there, we walked in, um, not knowing whether we'd find any place to eat and, you know, somehow, oh, hello, stranger, you know, it's the usual thing that happens. And we were, there's this very nice family where the wife was English, but the um, husband was a very proper Spitzdeutsch gentleman. Uh, who essentially adopted us. And after that, there was a waiting list of people who wanted to put us up for Shabbos. So Zurich was very different from yeah. the time in Paris and Marseille because every Shabbos we were actually staying with the local community. We didn't really make contact with the communities in Paris. And this Zurich. being a very long time ago in Europe, you felt safe walking around with the keeper? Absolutely. Didn't. I didn't, so the first time I became nervous about this and sort of stopped, shifted to a beret was at the time of, I think it's the first Lebanese war, which was, I don't remember, 1990, I don't remember the first, but the first Lebanese war, and there was really some very nasty graffiti that yeah. I saw when I was visiting Zurich. And that was at the point where I decided I probably would be safer to shift to a beret. I'll just point out the irony of history that chronologically, in 1972, you were closer in years to the Holocaust than you are to 2021, and you felt perfectly oh, safe in Europe. It's amazing. Absol absolutely. But, but, well, but the 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 holocaust was re, was such a shock to people who had any sensitivity that it tended to suppress anti-semitic thoughts yeah and as it gets further away it's less of a suppression and that's why it comes back yeah yeah now just generally there's always value in 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 the sabbaticals just culturally, were there new approaches in mathematical physics that you were exposed to in Europe? New ideas, new areas of research that you might not have considered otherwise? 
So yes and no. So yes, I actually, particularly the fall was an incredibly productive time for me. And I did do new areas, but it wasn't with Europeans. So the, the fall, one of the things I started doing was that Elliot Lee was also visiting um, IHES. By the way, Mazel Tov to Elliot Lee. He just was Yes, awarded. absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, absolutely. I, I was really thrilled to get the email yesterday yeah. from the APS. Yep. Um, uh, and when I already exchanged, I sent him a Mazel Tov instantly. Good. <laughs> um, uh, so Elliot um, had this, you know, had this idea that, that Thomas Fermi might be an interesting subject that might there might be something there that was really relevant to quantum mechanics and it wasn't just some uncontrolled approximation. That was a totally new direction for my research, which I started in Paris, but it wasn't due to the Parisians. It was due to Elliot. And I had this idea that Griff, Bob Griffiths, who was um, spent most of his career and was then in uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he had some ideas that he used in um, uh, in e studying easing models that I thought might have interesting possibilities for quantum field theory. And I essentially wrote to him, did he have any idea about how to extend it? I didn't say to quantum field theory, but to these continuous spins, we exchanged some letters and we started working together. So this was again, a new direction of my research. I had a, the possibility because I wasn't teaching to think in new directions, but it wasn't because I had new ideas from local people I met. I was visiting places that had other visitors. And so, I, yes, I went in a new direction due to, due to my corresponding to someone in Pittsburgh and my meeting with another American. Um, and, you know, and this actually happened again when I was in Australia, where I told you, I mentioned this work on ultra contractivity that was with a visiting Englishman. And uh, the work on Barry's face was because I met Barry, who was also visiting there from... So it, it's always other people can be very stimulating, but they don't have to be locals. They, they, often you're, when you're visiting someplace, it's because they like to have lots of visitors. And so you interact with other visitors. Barry, what work came out of these interactions, visitors with other visitors while you were in Europe? So I mentioned the work with Lieb. I mentioned the work with Griffiths. Um, You know, it was also, I, I essentially um, synthesized, and synthesis is not the right word, I essentially um, was able to sort of take, there had been this incredible explosion connected with Euclidean quantum field theory, and I was able to use the year in Europe to somehow package it in a way put together everything in a, in a sensible way. So I gave lots of lectures. Um, and in particular at ETH, I, uh, um, I gave a series of lectures that uh, turned into the book on P52 theory that was the first constructive field theory book. Um, and it's, it was really, it was because I essentially wrote this entire book in 10 weeks. It was quite, it was working very hard. And, you know, there were, they were, there were lots of good students in the class. And Jörg Frillick, who was at the time a postdoc in Geneva, uh, I gave him this lectures twice a week. And he took the train from Geneva to Zurich to come to the lectures. And he was really very, he was a very stimulating student. 
Barry, when you got back to Princeton, 1973-1974, I mean, just the excitement in particle physics generally around this time. I mean, you have Gross and Wilczek, you have what Sam Ting is doing at Brookhaven, the November Revolution at Slack, George Ian Glashow on Grand Unification at Harvard. Were you aware just in real time of just how formative all of these events were? And how, if at all, did you slot into what was happening in particle physics? Okay, so... I wasn't, so I certainly, the Ting, the, the November Revolution, everyone was talking about. I knew, I, I sort of knew about it. Um, the, the gross will check stuff, you know, David had an office across the hall from me. Um, so I, I knew. I'd interacted with them and I, and I, you know, I knew that they were doing this, but I didn't realize quite how important it was. I suspect I was not the only person, you know, they, it took a little while before I think what they'd done had been quite appreciated, but um, I did play something of a role in their work. Um, so I mentioned that there was this period where it was known I was being promoted, although I have not officially been promoted. And uh, the chair of the Graduate Admissions Committee in Physics, um, was Val Fitch, who later got the Nobel Prize, um, went to see Arthur about one of the applications they had. who would seem to be interested in mathematical physics. And Arthur said to Val, well, you know, Barry's not officially even in physics yet, but he's about to become a regular member of the faculty. I hope you don't mind if I discuss this with Barry. So he brought me the application of this uh, uh, young guy. So this must have been um, early in, this, my, this, this was you just don't quite work out right. No, this was not when I was about to be promoted to tenure. This was when I was about to turn from a postdoc. So this was in fact in the early in 1970. So I was promoted to tenure in 72. So this was, I was about to be promoted to assistant, to become an assistant professor jointly. And in, I had been just in math, but I was about to become an assistant professor in um, math and physics. He asked Fitch if he could bring the application to me. And we looked at it and the, this is someone who wanted to come to graduate school in physics at Princeton and uh, had been a math major at Chicago as an undergraduate and had taken very little physics, but had absolute raves from, I didn't tell you the story on Zoom. I told you the story, I think. Uh, I did not tell you the story before you don't, you don't, the story is not one you've heard from me. No. Okay. Um, so he, he brought me this folder. He had, very strong letter I remember from uh, Calderon. Uh, and we both decided he was likely to come to Princeton and work in mathematical physics if he came and we definitely wanted him. So we recommended very strongly to Fitch that uh, he be admitted. And Fitch was a mensch and he was not admitted. Um, uh, it was a close decision. It's a very hard decision to, to uh, and Arthur came to me. This was late morning one day. He said, well, they met yesterday and they didn't accept this guy. And it just happened. So in mathematics, admissions was done in a very different way. In physics, there's a committee that made the decision. In mathematics, the committee makes a preliminary cut, but the final decision is made 
at a meeting of the entire faculty, which again, because I was about to become a professorial faculty, I was invited to that meeting happened to be a lunch meeting shortly after we learned that this guy had not been admitted. So I said to Arthur, why don't we take him over to math? Maybe they'll admit him because we, but we had math. Uh, we had students from both math and physics doing mathematics and physics. And with these rave letters from the mathematicians, he was in fact admitted. And even though I don't know what happened with his other acceptances, he decided he liked the idea of coming to Princeton. He came to Princeton in pure mathematics. Um, and after he passed his qualifying exam in math, he went and said, you know, I'd really like to do a theoretical physics um, uh, PhD. And I, I'm, I will claim I'm responsible for his having been a graduate student at Princeton, this student. Um, and he was told, well, if it has some mathematical component, we'll still accept it. Sure, if they want to have you work with them, it's fine with us. So he went over to work with David Gross, as you might have guessed, this is Frank Kolchak. Yeah. <laughs> and his, his thesis was the, was the work they got the Nobel Prize for. Um, it was so impressive that they insisted he transfer to physics and actually get his PhD in <laughs> physics. They didn't want him to get a PhD in math. But that was my connection to, to Gross and Wilczek. Um, I, I did not, uh, and, you know, I, from a point of view of mathematical rigor, the, the ideas connected that I needed to, to do this are so far with anything we can do even 40 years later, mathematically rigorously, it's, it's, it's no connection between. I, I, I understand something of what they did. I very much appreciate it, but it's not something I could research on. The, the, the connection between at least the, the work that was being done in, in mathematically rigorous quantum field theory we were doing and uh, um, what particle physicists doing is still quite distant. They, they it turns out, have separate math and string theorists too have separate mathematical questions that are very interesting and you can answer mathematically, but it's it's a very different style of mathematics from what mathematical physicists are doing. So Barry, when did you start collaborating with Joel Leibowitz? So I actually do not think I have any joint papers with Joel. I'm looking at your publication list. You have something with him and Lieb, operator theory needed in quantum statistical mechanics. Okay, so that's not a yes and no. So that that's not a collaboration. They they wrote a, a, a very important paper, and they realized there were some technical issues that they weren't quite sure how to do, but they figured were right up my alley. So Elliot, I think, probably came to me and persuaded me to write an appendix to their paper. So, you know, if I had a different personality, I might have insisted that I be a joint author on the whole paper, but it wasn't right. They had this important piece of work and I had this little caboose. So fine, I wrote an appendix. Elliot, by the way, did this a second time with the, there's a paper with he and Ruskai where I have a, uh, an appendix. So it, it uh, Joel and I never really worked together. Uh, that said, um, he had a tremendous influence in, in the statistical mechanics. So I mentioned um, that, that uh, where Rosen and I had found these connections. Now, I was the one who knew all this rigorous statistical mechanics because Joel used, the author and Joel had, were very good, knew each other well. Joel had this 
half, every half year had, um, still has. I mean, it's sort of remarkable. He's close to or over 90. I'm not sure which now. He still runs half every uh, twice a year the statistical mechanics meeting. It's different from when he was at Yeshiva. When he was at Yeshiva University, the meeting was not one day, it was two days, maybe even three, but one day was just on rigorous results and had in-depth meetings. And I went to those from probably when I was a graduate student and it's where I learned a lot of the rigorous statistical mechanics. So I knew Joel well. Uh, my second leave after being in France in 1976-77 was actually at Yeshiva University, so I could commute there from Princeton at Joel's invitation. Um, it was such a successful year that they decided to close the belt for graduate school at the end of the year, um, which eventually got Joel, I mean, convinced Joel to leave Yeshiva University, but, but uh, it was a very, that was also, going on leave was very useful because you don't have as many responsibilities and you can focus on research. It was actually a very useful thing. I mean, I did that. Barry, what about your work on convergence theorems for entropy? This is an appendix to Lee Ben Ruskai. Right. So that was, again, similar thing. What happened was they had a technical issue in extending their res they, they've proven some important inequalities, the so-called strong subadditivity of entropy. And their formal proof was only for um, finite matrices. And they wanted to know it for operators infinite dimensions. And to me, this is an exercise that you could have even given to a good graduate student. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the depth of the strong side additivity of entropy. It's important that they get it all right. But Elliot said, let's ask Barry. I'm sure he can do it. And of course, I very quickly did it. And they asked me to write an appendix. So that's, that's where that came in. Basically, I was a, a that's the right way of putting it. I was a peace worker, right? They, you, you, you make a suit and you might, you might have someone do a little sewing for you on the side. That's what I was on these two papers. That's what I was the, <laughs> the guy they hired to do a little bit of uh, fixing the cups. Barry, what was the draw for you to take leave at Yeshiva University in 76, 77? Oh, well, I mean, the biggest draw was that it was commuting to Princeton, from Princeton. So trying to remember, it, it just made sense to, to stay at Princeton. 76, I think by then, anyhow, it, it just, we didn't particularly wanna, we had at that point, a one-year-old that was actually the year 76. Yes, that was the year. My wife was probably pregnant at the start of that year. Um, it just made sense not to leave Princeton. Now, I could have gone to Columbia or NYU, but somehow I knew Joel. It was... And the physics department at Yeshiva was strong at that point. Absolutely. It had Suskin, and, and the reason it was strong is it had a really strong chairman. His name was Joel Eboitz. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, he was responsible for there being strong people in math. And again, he, that was Joel's influence. Joel made a, it's a real crime that they closed down Belfort. Yeah. Did you interact much with Suskin when you were there? Well, again, he no more than I interacted with Sam Treeman or or David Gross. They would we would occasionally dis discuss, but no, they're not. I've never had really 
other than sort of talking, to, I've never had strong mathematical interactions. Um, well, that's not quite true. I haven't really with, with most of the, certainly the big names I have, and it's occasionally been a postdoc in um, high energy physics, or that would come to me with some technical issue that would lead to a paper. Now, I know it's but, a different world, but just being around Susskind, were you aware of the early waves being made in string theory at this point, 76? Uh, I don't think there were any, there, I'm not sure anything. So, I mean, there's the Veneziano model. There's... Right. So the Veneziano model, I was certainly aware of, um, partly, you know, I was earlier, Veneziano model is connected to Reggie, to Reggie poles. And I was aware of that because it has, it's more closely connected to the non-relativistic quantum mechanics that I've worked on. So I was certainly aware of the work on the Veneziano model. Um, I don't, did, certainly did not discuss it with Suskin. Um, I'm, I didn't have a lot of interaction with, with him. Barry, tell me about your work on the Yukawa model. So with these Nelson ideas, um, uh, we had, we, and, and, you know, again, when the, the in constructive field theory, the, the biggest heroes in many ways were Bloom and Jaffe and their group. Um, and there was competition and sometimes not always um, good relations between uh, them and us. Um, I'm sure they think that's due to me. I think it's due to them. But but uh, it was quite clear there. The, the next model after P phi two, that's natural is Yukawa. It has more slightly more complicated renormalizations than P phi two. And uh, I had actually, as I mentioned last in the last interview, there's this work on Bublesians on this work of cayenne yellow that actually was already Yukawa. So I'd done as this graduate student, this work that was not within the framework of constructive field theory, but just understanding something connected with Yukawa like ideas. Um, and there was a, postdoc at the Institute named uh, Erhard Zeidler, who was uh, visiting, who began to, to uh, realize there was a natural way of understanding Euclidean Yukawa theory in terms of um, regularizing determinants. This fit exactly in with the earlier work I'd done, and he and, he and I started working together prove some interesting results on in, in uh, theory, just operative theory and regularizing determinants and led to these papers on Yukawa. Um, it's interesting work, but not, not as, not of the significance of the earlier work in the Bose field theory. What about, what about your work on phase transitions and symmetry breaking? Ah, now that's, that's much, that's, that's certainly the top among the top most important. So that that actually had interesting roots. So this must have begun. In the fall of 75. So this is the year before I was on leave at Yukawa. Early in the fall. I heard, so Tom Spencer was at the time at Rutgers. Jörg Frelich was an assistant professor at Princeton. We had this incredible group of young assistant professors. And I heard, I don't remember from whom, not from them, that they had discovered a way of proving breaking of continuous symmetry in um, 
three-dimensional since it, it was known that two-dimensional theories do not normally have continuous symmetry breaking, that uh, they found a, a very elementary, very simple argument, uh, which someone could, and it wasn't them. I don't remember who explained it to me. It was just this rumor going around. They found this lovely argument. And I immediately realized that it was very important to understand what would happen in the actual uh, corresponding discrete lattice models, the purely statistical mechanical models, the so-called uh, classical Heisenberg model. And it was not obvious how to extend their argument, but I sort of understood and found, uh, I realized that one of the things that they used that didn't obviously extend, I understood how to, why, where it came from and was therefore able to prove this classical, this result on um, the classical Heisenberg model, which of course people doing statistical mechanics, they couldn't care, could care less about quantum field theory, but they were very excited about this. And at some point, the three of us realized we actually had a, we got together at the AMS meeting in San Antonio and decided what really made sense is to, to join forces and do this joint paper. And shortly after we found a really streamlined, elegant way of doing what I had um, done for this classical Heisenberg, and this led to this Frilich Spencer Simon paper um, on, uh, that is in fact still remains the only, the only proof of continuous symmetry breaking in physics, in any physical model for not, with non-abelian symmetry groups. There are some with uh, pure rotation, very specialized, but it's very general argument. And then Jörg went off to leave in Europe. Tom and I had never had, at that point, had not had much interaction with each other. And I decided, well, the next natural step was to do quantum models. And Elliot was very interested. In, when Elliot had heard that I'd done the uh, the, uh, the classical Heisenberg model he said to me, you know, this is not known. This is really very interesting. I said, yeah, I know. He said, oh, congratulations. We talked about it. We decided we should look at the quantum model. And I don't remember quite how we got Dyson involved, but it was one of the most fun things. Elliot and Freeman and I would get together. The only way, you know, it, Whenever we were at the university, there were too many people that wanted to see me. So the only way we get anything done is the three of us would meet in Dyson's office. We had, we agreed, we'd set up, it was, I think, like three hours once a week, the same day. And we just sit there and we talk about all sorts, we were working on this, but we talk about all sorts of other things. And we, we couldn't quite get things to work. And Freeman went off to give a talk somewhere. And Elliot and I figured out this last step. Not correctly, as it will turn out. It's a moment. But we thought we'd finally done everything. And Elliot had the idea, you know, this was long before email and other things. We sent a telegram. He was so excited. We sent a telegram to Dyson that read, Mr. Heisenberg has arrived. That was the whole telegram. <laughs> and we then wrote an announcement. We realized, and one of the things that we realized early is in the classical case, the, the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet are exactly the same thing. Uh, there's a symmetry that takes one to the other. But in quantum mechanics, you can't realize this symmetry by a unitary, it's an anti-unitary. And so the quantum Heisenberg and the 
quantum man the quantum Heisenberg ferromagnet and the quantum Heisenberg antiferromagnet are quite different and the antiferromagnet has frustration and other things and is really we got it before our work we got a much harder problem and we had these ideas that work that both for the quantum Heisenberg and the quantum anti Heisenberg we announced and we wrote a physical review letter and we then wrote the full paper and submitted it and it was accepted and the next year York Froelich was in back in Princeton and decided to give a course on our paper we got the galley proofs of the full paper physical review paper Peter and actually put it at, put it in the mailbox which was the department mailbox it wasn't the US mailbox and York walks into Elliot's office and says to Elliot I don't understand why such and such is true Elliot says I don't know let's go ask Barry he looks and I look take one look at it and I go the zoo is very interesting because right because I have this false background while I have like this <laughs> anyhow I, I really hit my head I realized that instantly that we made a, something wasn't right that for the antiferromagnet everything worked fine but for the ferromagnet we used a trick that just was wrong and so we and we were sure we could fix it. We never fixed it. And 35 years later, nobody's fixed it. And it's still true that it's only for the quantum antiferromagnet magnet that one has proven continuous symmetry breaking and the, uh, uh, the Heisenberg model. Uh, it didn't, and it's, you know, it's an embarrassment that uh, we have this announcement that's wrong. And I joke, well, it's a good thing. It was, we weren't three unknowns. Uh, what was Freeman Dyson like? He was a very funny guy, very, very different from most people I've dealt with. Um, very, I don't know the right word, oracular in the sense that, you know, he would think about something and sound like an oracle almost, but, but really very, very, very clever, very sweet temperament, had lots of funny jokes. I, it was a pleasure to deal with him. We didn't, except for this one piece of work, we somehow didn't interact that often. We had these, these famous brown bag lunches that he would come to and it'd be very interesting when he'd make comments, but I, I didn't really have as much interaction with him as I might have. And was he um, mostly at the Institute or he was in the, on campus? He was, except when he came to the Brown Bag, I'm not sure. And, occasion, and he sometimes came to the seminar, didn't always, he really was on campus. It was almost always the Institute. And, be, and until he started coming to the Brown Bag, I don't think I'd ever seen him on campus. And for you, how much time did you spend at the Institute? Except when people are working together, they really, you know, they, they're both in Princeton, but it's, it's, you know, it's a, probably a 40 minute walk. It's only a 15, I mean, it's a winding, but it's 10 or 15 minutes to drive. We just, there isn't that much, people don't spend the, as much time as you might guess they might spend in, together. But in terms of like where where the most exciting talks would be for you, would they be more likely in the department? I would rarely, I would rarely go to the most. It would be, so we, you know, I would go to, certainly there was a mathematical physics seminar. I would go to every week. And I, there were math and physics colloquia many weeks I'd go to. There might be two or three other in, at the university. 
if I went to a dozen talks of any kind at the Institute in a year, it would be a lot. Because it's a schlep. You can't, right? Unless you're going to, if there's someone you're working with there, you go there, you go and work with them. And, right? But otherwise, it's making a trip for, right? It, it's not an, it's not just walking down to the seminar and walking up afterwards. It's, and it's a, it just isn't. So there would be announcements, but there isn't as much interaction between the university and the Institute as one might expect. Barry, one last question before we break for Hanukkah. When, when did Ed Witten enter the scene? It's not a three minute answer. <laughs> Chronologically, at least. Oh, so he first came as a graduate student to Princeton in uh, the fall of 1973. When does it so, first become apparent that he had these abilities? That's part of the long. So I, I need to tell the whole story, and and it's not a three minute story. Okay. So well, why don't we break? Why don't we break three minutes early, and this will begin. Although you've taken the punchline by saying it's about Witten, but I'll tell you the story about about uh, Ed Witten and me. Something to look forward to. I'll see you back at six o'clock. Good.